Hello, Trinity Tigers, and welcome to Learning Together. These series of webinars are brought to you by your Trinity University Alumni Relations Office as part of the university's commitment to bring you lifelong learning opportunities for, your, for all our alumni. I am Kay Casey. I serve as Assistant Vice President at Trinity University, and today I'm going to have the pleasure of speaking with David Odie. David is a Trinity alumnus, class of? 1981. 1981, <laughs> and he is also a nationally sought after speaker on how to best present your ideas and presentations. When <clears throat> David graduated, excuse my voice. <clears throat> when David graduated from Trinity University in radio, film, and television, or maybe it was Ra radio, radio, TV, film is what radio, they TV, RTF. film, <laughs> uh, along with physics. Along with physics, he had visions <laughs> of creating stories of based on scientific e explorations, but his. His background in physics led him more into the digital aspects of broadcasting. And, and after 25 years of doing that, he became very well known in digital radio technologies. But what I'm curious about, David, is going from digital radio technologies to storytelling. <laughs> how, how did that occur? How did that occur? Well. And when I was in broadcast engineering, I worked mostly on the behind the scenes technologies that make things like live TV news and sports coverage possible and the digital microwave infrastructure that supported that. And because of the work I was doing, when there was a new technology being rolled out into that industry that was making a lot of people nervous, it was decided that there needed to be a major training effort to support the rollout of this technology. And I got involved initially as the subject matter expert on the training, and then I ended up having to run the whole training project, <laughs> which was a bit of a change in, in my plans. It was a huge project, industry-wide, nationwide. We reached the essentially the entire US TV broadcasting industry from Maine to Hawaii, from, and from the US Virgin Islands to Guam. And in 33 months, we trained over 10,000 people in about 900 locations. Wow. And at the end of that, I decided that was fun. Uh, but you know what? I'm done with television. Because I realized I'd spent a career providing the platform that people use to tell their stories. But what really fascinated me, especially having grown up with a hearing mm -hmm. impairment, I think, mm -hmm. was the nature of how we tell stories and why we tell stories. It was really the communication process that got me interested in broadcasting initially. So after that project wrapped up in late 2009, I decided I was done with television. But mm -hmm. training, coaching, public speaking, these were things that intrigued me. So that's what I've been doing as a self-employed entrepreneur since about 2011. Well, and with David's new second career expertise, <laughs> We are going to hear today about how stories should be told in a way to connect with your audience. We'll also hear some tips on how to bring, make stories concise, compelling, and convincingly winning for your idea, business, or cause. Now, before we begin our webinar, I do want to uh, reassure everyone who's listening today that you will have the opportunity to submit your questions directly to David. Just refer to your Q&A, your question and answer tab on your screen. So David, let's get started. Mm -hmm. When we first met, it was just this past summer, mm -hmm. and we were in Denver, Colorado, and you were at a gathering of Trinity alumni, That's and right. I, along with Ryan Finley, our Senior Director of Alumni Relations, mm -hmm. and our President mm -hmm. of the University, Danny Anderson, mm -hmm. were attending. You and I started a conversation about storytelling, and um, but you, we moved into it because you said you had just been in Montana, I mm -hmm. believe, for a conference. Now, well, how did you 
go to Montana for a conference? <laughs> well, it was, it was a day-long training that I did for a little company in Hamilton, Montana, which is in the picturesque Bitterroot Valley of western Montana, south of Missoula. It's a company that, uh, it's a pharmaceutical company that for years has made one ingredient for a vaccine. And what's going on there right now is they're doubling the size of the plant and they're going to make a second product. And it, the, the tension in this little <laughs> company was palpable because of this change. It was, you know, 100% ramp up from what they've been doing to what they were going to do. And so I went there to do some soft skills training, some change management training with their project managers. And be, because connections out of Missoula being what they were, I couldn't get back till the next morning, which is why I had just come back from there <laughs> when I met you and uh, President Anderson and the others at that, uh, that gathering because I do live in the Denver area and that was actually my first time to attend one of the Denver alumni gatherings. So well, we I hope did. it won't be your last. I'm sure it won't. <laughs> well, we were, as we were talking, we, we were continuing this discussion of storytelling mm -hmm. and w we were both struck by the commonalities that we shared and the perspectives we shared regarding the valid use of the ancient craft of storytelling. Mm -hmm in our modern today's careers. Yes. And uh, we, were, we had discussed how storytelling seems to really help people recall, remember, reflect, and then project themselves into the story and mm -hmm. becoming part of what's the solution or how can I help with the cause. Mm -hmm. And we discussed that, isn't it amazing that in this modern age of electronics and sophistication, that the art of telling the story mm -hmm. still has value. Oh, it does. And so I would love for you to share with our audience today your perspectives of why storytelling is important. Storytelling is, has been described as the basic unit of human interaction. Um, I have two sisters, as you know, who graduated <laughs> from Trinity as well. And I was talking with my sister Carol just yesterday, and she had been listening uh, to a speaker talk about how the brain seems to be hardwired for connecting with stories. Maya Angelou says, people will not remember what you say or what you do, they'll remember how you make them feel. And mm -hmm. stories go to the heart of how we feel about each other. And so what I had to learn when I changed careers from a technical career into one where I'm, I'm speaking and training and coaching other speakers is I realized I had a lot to learn about the tools and techniques. And the most powerful tool, I think, in any, st in any speaker's toolbox is the story. Being able to tell a story well, because what that does is it connects with your audience at an emotional level. And then it prompts your audience to remember what you've said. The connection and the, the active uh, choice to remember what's being said are the way that your information will make a difference. Information doesn't sell itself. And the mistake I see so many speakers make over and over is to think it's all about the information. It's not about the information. It's about what you can do for your audience and it starts with making a connection with them. And story is one of the most powerful ways of connecting with people. Now, is there any kind of scientific evidence or theories about how this connection occurs? Well, yes, there is. In fact, we can check a, a slide now and, and show this for the people who are really into the chemical side of things. Uh, this is a diagram of a very complex looking molecule and <laughs> having been through the physics department but not so much chemistry, I can't explain much of what's on that diagram except that. It is a complex chain, it is a very I can tell you that. Yes, <laughs> it is and this is the uh, model of a neurotransmitter chemical in the brain called oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with Oxycontin, the highly addictive opioid, or OxyClean, which is probably in your laundry room somewhere. <laughs> oxytocin is in your brain. And when you experience a surge of oxytocin in your brain, what that does is it prompts feelings of empathy toward another person. It's mm -hmm. probably responsible for 
in, in large measure, the development of human society, the reason that we're social animals, is because of this oxytocin. It's sometimes called the bonding hormone. <laughs> well, it's been known for some time that you get a surge of oxytocin in your brain when you hug or caress someone, or even when you pet your dog. Oh, no wonder I love my dog. That's right. <laughs> That's right, because every time you pet your dog, your brain is expressing more oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Well, what I read a few years ago that was so interesting to me was some research that a Harvard researcher named Paul Zak was doing um, in the expression of oxytocin. And what he found through his experiments is that oxytocin surges when you hear a story. So if you are sitting in front of a, if you're sitting in front of your TV screen watching a compelling movie or TV drama, or if you're sitting in a movie theater, you get caught up physically in what's going on and your brain is responding as if those things were happening to you. What he found was that there, there's a particular structure to stories that prompts the expression of oxytocin. And he also found that when speakers use stories in a way that prompts the expression of oxytocin, people will have been shown experimentally to remember the points that that speaker makes more effectively when measured two weeks later. Oh my gracious. Yes. That's impressive. So, so when, you, when you're telling a good story, you're changing your audience's biochemistry in a way that's legal <laughs> <laughs> and temporary. And, and meaningful. And meaningful. That's right. That's right. And there's a particular way that needs to be done because what he found is that the stories that prompt a surge of oxytocin create a certain amount of tension in the brain. You see, he said, uh, Paul Zak says that attention is in short supply. <laughs> attention is a precious commodity and tension sustains attention. Tension sustains attention. So what you need when you're telling a story is a character that your audience can identify mm -hmm. with, who is striving for something that initially he or she cannot attain. So there's a combination, there's sort of a collision of this strong desire and this obstacle to satisfying that desire. And therein lies the story, therein lies the tension. So when I heard this, I realized what he was describing is a basic story model that I learned several years ago from another speaker by the name of Ed Tate, and I'll share that with you. It's the simplest model of storytelling I know. A wants B despite C. And the, the despite is the tension. Yes, that's right. And, and wanting the B, there's that strong desire. A uh -huh. wants B despite C. Cinderella wants to go to the ball despite not having a gown or shoes or transportation. Dorothy wants to come home from Oz to spite the Wicked Witch who wants her shoes. Mm -hmm. You can apply this model to any story you know. And it's a very basic model and it helps you see, you can get into more elaborate story models like how do you relieve the tension and, and show the change in the characters and all that. But if you start with the most basic model, what that does is it prompts you to think about that tension. What does someone want and what is the obstacle to attaining that desire, whether they want to live happily ever after, they want to find the love of their life, they want to find the one ring. <laughs> there is something that the character wants. And this works for any kind of story, and even a very technical presentation, you can get into this. So with, with tension, do you also get empathy? Yes, that's the key, you see, is that with this tension, it creates a surge of empathy in the listener's mind for the speaker. And that's what you want because the decision-making center is in the emotional part of the brain. So if you want your listeners to make the active decision to accept and remember and take action on what you're saying, you need to develop an emotional connection and that empathy is what allows you to do that. So a story with, some, with an appropriate amount of tension to it prompts the oxytocin, oxytocin leads to feelings of empathy, and that leads to your audience wanting your solution before they even know what it is. Fascinating. Now, we're talking about tension 
and empathy. Mm -hmm. And yet, how can people use this if they're dealing with perhaps technical proposals or ideas, mm -hmm. such as mm -hmm. a scientific wanting support for a scientific research or wanting to perhaps launch a new business? Mm -hmm. um, how could this be used? How could this empathetic tool be used in more of a technical mm -hmm. presentation? Mm -hmm. More technical presentation. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is that um, the mistake I see quantitative thinkers make <laughs> over and over again in speaking to people is they forget the very human element. And that human element is so essential. And it gets stripped out of a lot of presentations. I was speaking to a group of scientists earlier this week here in, here in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. They were having a, a big convention downtown. And so I'll use a, a scientific presentation as an example. In scientific presentations, so much of the time, you're, uh, you get, well, here's the, the problem we were trying to solve, here's our apparatus, here's our procedure, here's our solution, here's what it means to you. And what they're leaving out is, what drove you to want to solve that problem in mm -hmm. that way? Mm -hmm. And so what I encourage people to do is, you don't need to give me all the details that are in your paper. What you want to get me to do is to read your paper. You want, you want to drive my curiosity about yes, your topic. Definitely. And the way you do that is to create that empathy. So I would say, don't start with the typical, here's our apparatus and our procedure. Start with A wants B despite C. What did you want? Science is all about solving mysteries. That's the mysteries right. of, the, of the world, right? Yeah. The mysteries of the yeah. universe. And some scientists I've known, including my sister Carol, who is a biologist, she got her degree from biology here in Trinity, um, are really good storytellers. But so many scientists aren't because they forget that they're mm -hmm. really there to solve a mystery. So even if you're giving a technical presentation, whether you're a scientist, an engineer, any kind of, uh, or, or a business person, anyone giving a quantitative, analytical type of presentation, start by telling me what desire drove you to want to solve this problem mm -hmm. and what obstacle did you have to overcome to solve it? Because there was a reason someone else hadn't already done what you just did. Mm -hmm. You had to do something to expand the boundaries of knowledge in that field or to create a new technology or you're solving a problem by, by creating a new business or a new business mm -hmm. model. What was the strong desire? When you start with that, mm -hmm. you're going to hook people's empathy and curiosity and then they'll want your solution. So don't focus on the mechanics or the how-to, but focus more on the why. The why, that's right. Story is all about the why. So David, how are there some common mistakes that people can accidentally do when they're trying oh, yes. to use storytelling? Oh yes. I hear a lot of attempts at storytelling in presentations that fall flat because people miss one or the other of, of several opportunities to connect more deeply with their audience. And one way that that's often missed is when there's too much backstory. Okay, if A wants B despite C, mm -hmm. I need to know who A is, what the situation is, just enough to understand that strong desire that propels the story into motion. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know, well, for example, we never knew why Dorothy was living with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. I don't oh, think, I read no. all the Oz books and I don't think there was ever an explanation <laughs> of what happened to Dorothy's parents. I always wondered that. she was living with her that. aunt and uncle. Al <laughs> <laughs> Frank Baum realized we didn't need that backstory uh -huh. to appreciate how that story was set into motion. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing I often see is that people will weigh down their stories with too much backstory, too much unnecessary detail that doesn't help us understand the character and the strong desire. Another mistake that people often make is summed up in the phrase, take me, don't tell me. Oh. Take me, don't tell me. Take me into that scene. Don't just tell me, well, um, uh, my, my partner said you need to stop doing that because you've just narrated past an opportunity for dialogue. I was doing something and my wife said, stop that right now. <laughs> you see, that's more compelling. I often start my seminars with the story of how I ended up running that training project. 
And the way that came about was I was hired as the subject matter expert and the fellow who hired me was the training expert. And of course, for a training project, you need two basic ingredients. Mm -hmm. You need to know how to train, that's the training expertise, and what to train, that's the subject matter expertise. So between the two of us, we had the bases covered, right? Mm -hmm. Except that shortly after he hired me, that guy left the company. <laughs> and so I went to his boss, the CEO of this little company, and I said, what's your plan for replacing him? And of course, the boss said, you. You. <laughs> So I was, uh, I was stumped because I thought, well, I'm not a training expert. I, in the course of my, I had been the chief engineer of KLRU TV in Austin, home of, of course, everyone knows Austin City Limits. <laughs> I worked there for 11 years. And in the course of my engineering career, I had taught a lot of people how to use a lot of different technologies, but I had no formal training in training design, writing curriculum, training trainers. I said to myself, David, what are you going to do? You're not a training expert, you're an engineer. And then I realized what do engineers do? Engineers solve problems. How do you solve a problem? Step one, identify the problem. Well, I've done that. Mm -hmm. I need to become a training expert overnight. Yeah. Step two, gather information. Now, who can I talk to? Who can I talk to that knows something about this and will talk to me right away? <sighs> Light bulb moment. I picked up the phone and I said, Mom, <laughs> help! <laughs> For the audience, I turn to uh, Jerry, David's mom. My mother mom, is here in the studio. David's <laughs> mom, who's here with us today. So, and I a still spotlight have to tell on that mom. Story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's pick apart some elements of that story. Mm -hmm. If I had said, so I realized if I talked to my mom, she could help me. No one would have responded to that. But I say, so I picked up the phone and I said, Mom, help. Always gets a laugh. Mm -hmm. Because there's a little bit of tension there, a little bit of, oh, how's he going to solve this problem? He needs to become a training expert overnight. So there's the obstacle. You don't know how to be a training expert. How are you going to overcome that obstacle? So I relieved that tension in a surprising way because you didn't expect me to pick up the phone and call my mom for help. No, I did not. <laughs> and I revealed that surprise using quoted dialogue. Dialogue draws people into the story. And so many speakers, you ask what mistakes people make, so many speakers make the mistake of narrating past opportunities to mm -hmm. use dialogue. So when you both, what you heard in that brief story were two examples of dialogue. You heard internal dialogue. You heard me say to myself, so David, what are you gonna do? You're an engineer, you're not a training expert. Mm -hmm. Internal dialogue is a powerful tool for revealing how the character feels about that tension. It sets up more of the tension and can escalate it. And then character dialogue can so often be effective as a way of relieving the tension and in doing so often uncovering a little bit of the humor in the situation. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of tools that I often coach people in using to make their stories more effective. Well, in speaking of making stories more effective, I do want to re to remind our audience today that you are free to send questions to David Odie. If you're watching via your computer, just hit the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching via Facebook Live, submit your questions. We will, we will see them. So l let's continue on with some other things mm -hmm. that I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. um, ha where can someone learn I mean, we only have an hour here, right. and, and you're touching upon such an intriguing, but there m must be multiple things you must remember in how to tell the story. So where can someone learn more about using stories correctly mm -hmm. to gain support uh, for their idea of presentation? Well, one of the things that I did not long ago was I pulled together a lot of the different concepts and ideas that I've gathered from other speakers, as well as a couple of my own that are original oh. to me. And I put them together in a book, and maybe we could show that slide now. And this is a book that you can find on Amazon. It's called The Speaker's Quick Guide to Telling Better Stories. Uh, volume one in the Speaker's Quick Guide series. Yes. Okay? It is a fairly quick read. You can get through it in an hour or two. Mm -hmm. It is in very concise form a compilation 
of some different storytelling models. Mm -hmm. So not just the ABC model, but a couple of models that take you further. For example, once you've set up that tension, how do you relieve the tension and then show the change in that character as a result of their being able to overcome that mm -hmm. obstacle mm -hmm. so that you get more of a carry out message that way. So there's two additional story models okay. and there's chapters in there on what you, why you want to tell a story, what you want to try to accomplish by telling a story, mm -hmm. and then the nuts and bolts of how you go about putting it together and even a chapter on how to draw some more humor out of your story. Because the thing is, the mistake so many presenters make is to think it's all about the information. It's all about my need to deliver information. When we started that training project I was telling you about, uh -huh. I say we, it was a group of engineers. Yes. And we thought the problem we needed to solve was that people didn't have enough information about the technology. Because we were, that was an engineer-centric view that we took of the problem. We just kept telling ourselves, well, you know, as long as we can thoroughly explain coded orthogonal frequency division multiplexing to people, they'll be fine using this new technology. Well, <laughs> looking back on that now, I realize that would be like taking somebody on their first day in driver's ed and saying, well, we're going to explain to you how a turbocharger works. And once you understand that and can take it apart and put it back together again, maybe we'll let you get in the car and turn the ignition. We'll let you consider getting a license. <laughs> That's right. So in the, in the first trials of this training project, uh, they were not well received, I think for obvious reasons, <laughs> because we hadn't taken an audience-centric view. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned since then is to identify what's the need of the audience. And what the, the need that we needed to meet was that people were scared. Now, we never went into them and said, we're here to take away your fear. But what we did was we redesigned the training project in such a way that we made them feel comfortable realizing, discovering for themselves that this new technology wasn't going to change their jobs as much as they thought it would. So I discovered some principles in doing that about being more audience focused and I share some of those in this book, The Speaker's Quick Guide to Telling Better Stories, because it all became about the story. You know, we have one question that mm -hmm. is sort of fits where you are right mm -hmm. now. Is asking for some more examples of before and after, i.e., you know, what's a bad way and what's a right way? Can we mm. walk through maybe one <laughs> scenario? And, and please feel free to submit more questions if you would like. The before and after. There is a terrific model for using stories in a presentation that's based on that very idea. And it was developed by uh, a fellow who I, I mention in my book because he's been so instrumental in my learning. His mm -hmm. name is Craig Valentine. Ah. He was the 1999 world champion of public speaking. And so what he teaches is a technique called then, now, and how. Oh, okay. Then, now, and mm -hmm. how. I'll give you a quick example of how I might use that. After I became chief engineer of Austin's public TV station about in 1990, it was about that time that I had an opportunity to present a paper at the annual meeting of the Society of Broadcast Engineers, mm -hmm. which was being held in Houston that year. Now, I didn't know anything about presenting a paper. I drove to Houston. I went to the George R. Brown Convention Center on the edge of downtown. and. I walked into that room. It was a huge room. There were probably 300 chairs, 25 of which may have been occupied. <laughs> it was two in the afternoon. The lights were dim. What do you suppose started to happen? <laughs> People were going to sleep. Yes. And the brightest thing in the room was not me, but the screen. And I didn't know how to present a paper. I thought, well, I'll put some key phrases and some images from the paper up on the screen and narrate the slides. And of course, we've all seen people do that, right? What did I do? I bored my audience. I think that the guy in the back of the room who was running the audiovisual was snoring the loudest, and he was the guy <laughs> getting paid to be there. <coughs> now, fast forward to two days ago in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I'm in a classroom setting at a large convention where there are thousands of people in attendance. The room is set for about 100. 195 people squeezed into that room. 
to hear me talk about some of the things we're talking about today. And at the end, I had people lined up to talk to me. In Houston, nobody stuck around to say, I want to know more. Now, I've just given you a story from before and a story from after. And then what I typically do in a live audience setting is I'll say, what do you suppose made the difference? See, that's a great technique for engaging your audience. Mm -hmm. How do you suppose I went from not knowing how to give a paper at a conference in the early 90s to having a standing room only crowd? It's, it's not just because I was suddenly gifted with something. It's because of the people I learned from. It wasn't just good marketing. They taught me. <laughs> it wasn't just good marketing. <laughs> so I hope this answers the question that came in, the before and after, the bad way, the right way. When, when people see that you didn't always know what you know now, mm -hmm. then you are putting, as Craig Valentine puts it, you're putting the process and not the person on the pedestal. It's not about me, it's about what I've learned, it's about the processes that I followed. And by sharing that with people, then I make the, make the, help them realize that they can learn those processes too. Mm -hmm. You see, this is not just something I was born with. These are skills that I've acquired. I'm an introvert. I truly oh, am. Oh, come off it. <laughs> I am. I, I may stand in front of a room full of people all day long at a <laughs> seminar if I know I have something valuable to say to them. And that's called situational extroversion. Mm -hmm. And it's a skill set it that, I, that is. I've built over the years. If, if it weren't for that, I'd be curled up under a table somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so these are things that people can learn. And when you show someone, here's where I was. Here's where I am now. Now let's talk about the journey I took getting from point A to point B. And you see, you can take that journey too. Then that's a way that stories help motivate people. It's a way, it's called a push-pull technique. I'm trying to pull you away from the way you were and push you in a new direction. And stories are such a great tool for doing that. You've just got to make that connection with your audience and get the empathy flowing. That's why I always say, and you can show a slide again now, that's why I always like to say, you've got to put connection before content and empathy before evidence. Well, that beautifully summarizes what you've been sharing with us today, is the, the emotional side before the facts. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then the bringing forward of that engaging your audience. All about engagement before right. you lead them to the point that you want them to go. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, you know, we were talking about journeys and transitions. Mm -hmm. Your career has taken so many interesting turns. Mm -hmm. Tell me, in retrospective, how did your education here at Trinity University help prepare you for this? Oh, you know, I love that question because the thing is that um, my Trinity education, I feel like, gave me such a solid grounding in the liberal arts. And I think that is so important and becoming even more important all the time. When I was doing my research for the talk that I gave to those scientists mm -hmm. on Monday, I ran across an interesting observation by Mark Cuban. Oh. You know who he is? He's oh, yes. a billionaire tech yeah. entrepreneur, right? He says he thinks that within 10 years, a liberal arts degree in philosophy will be worth more in the job market than a degree in computer science because of advances in mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. There are so many jobs people are doing mm -hmm. right now that you know, if, if you're not within 10 years of retirement, you better count on adding more skills. Yes. I mean, I, can, I, I could list for you the many, well, some of the many <laughs> skills that have become obsolete in my career, okay? Uh, I did radio early on. I, I was at KRTU right here at Trinity University as a freshman. And I knew how to take those things we called albums, the big uh, precursors of compact discs, right? And put them on a felt covered turntable <laughs> and cue them up. And of course, now some of the people listening to this will have to Google those words. <laughs> I taught so many technologies that are now obsolete. And yet all along, I knew that my value didn't just depend 
on being able to turn a knob, calibrate something, watch the green squiggly lines on an oscilloscope. You know, I, I like to say when I was young, and I won't say stupid because I'm a Trinity grad, but when I was young <laughs> and naive, I thought the most interesting problems were the ones you solve by connecting boxes and wires and making screens light up and, and, and lights flash. And through the course of my career, I've had the privilege of discovering that the most interesting problems are the ones you solve by connecting people. People. And that, I think, is the, the grounding, the foundation that Trinity gave me. Because it's so important not just to build skills, but to build that base of knowledge through, through which you can interpret the world. You know, people sometimes wonder, well, David, how did you end up double majoring in radio, TV, film, and <laughs> physics? Well, I'll tell you this, I don't know if this is true now. Maybe I should go have a conversation with someone about this. But when I was at Trinity, there was this unwritten rule that if you had a major in the journalism, broadcasting, and film department, you were, let's say, strongly encouraged <laughs> to have a second major outside that department because they didn't want to be graduating people who knew all kinds of techniques to communicate but had nothing useful to say. So I feel like my Trinity education has helped me know that I have something to say. Well, and the story of connections and relativity uh, because of those connections is still very much the pattern of education here at Trinity mm. today. Mm -hmm. And I, I always get such joy when I meet a young person who says that they're majoring in science or they're majoring in business, but they're also taking Chinese mm -hmm. or, or even Greek or Latin. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the beauties of a Trinity uh, education. I think it is. I, I spent a lot of time taking courses in the music department. I also took some elective journalism classes. Now, of course, I was in the journalism broadcasting film department, but my major was on the radio TV film side, not the journalism side, like my, like my roommate David. And he said, oh, you don't want to take elective journalism classes because Marion Fromer, who was one of the professors <laughs> I so fondly remember from my time at Trinity, oh, She's such a hard grader. You don't want to take electives from her, you're going to blow your GPA. <laughs> but I took three elective courses from her in journalism. I won't get into the grades. I will say she helped me discover things about myself as a writer that I mm -hmm. never would have discovered otherwise. And it's certainly been useful today. It has. It has. It's helped it? me get my, get my books written. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a question about Talk a little bit more about your journey of becoming an entrepreneur, becoming an entrepreneur. from an employee and an expert in digital uh, telecommunications to an entrepreneur with well, your own business. Mm -hmm. I will say in large measure that was out of necessity mm -hmm. because when I transitioned out of that training project, and we knew when we went in that that project was going to run for a finite period of time and then it was going to be done. Okay, And um, there were incentives for people to stick with it to the very end um, and, and we, we did very well. It was, it was the right place for me, for me to be mm -hmm. at that time. And then I finished that project and I was, um, when did that happen? I was entering my 50s and I will tell you there is such a thing as age discrimination in the workplace because what I found was that um, instead of people looking at me and saying, wow, you have this wonderful Trinity education, <laughs> <laughs> there were potential employers who I'm sure were saying to themselves, gosh, you've got lots of skills, but at this point in your career, you probably have a lot of baggage too. And I, I think that that is, is part of what happened. So I did look around at some other opportunities that didn't mm -hmm. pan out. But the other thing that was going on in my head at the same time was I thought, what is it I really, truly want to do? Mm -hmm. I said to myself at one point, I said, David, you're 50 years old. What do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> and, and you still had a love for I, science. I had a love for to, science. And, and how to communicate that. Yes. And I realized I want to help people tell their story. It just, it all came back to that. I want to help people tell their story. And the best way that I found to do that was to become 
a speaker and speaking coach. And that's what has, that's where this has led me, back to here. <laughs> well, there's so many opportunities, but um, I want to share with our listening audience that we will have another webinar this month. Mm -hmm. It will Before be- Before you do that. Oh, yes. Could I let our viewers know about a special offer? Of course. That is at no cost to them? This is very important. Let's talk okay. about this. All right, let's do this because we still have the time. My website is davidote.com and people can go there and learn more about what I do and, and how they might engage with me. There is a secret page on that website that you can only get to by typing in davidote.com slash trinity. That's why we have this up on the mm -hmm. screen right now. So write that down or go to that website right now. Because what that page on my website allows you to do is to schedule a half hour with me. Now, normally I charge for my coaching, but I'm making a half hour available to anybody who's watching this webinar, as long as they can find the time on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> it's an automated process. And for the first 10 people who sign up for one of those coaching sessions, which will be done virtually using a, a Zoom call, for the first 10 people, uh, they're going to be asked for their mailing address, and I will mail them a copy of the book. Oh, David, that's so generous of you. Thank you so much for doing that. You're very welcome. Well, Trinity grads are exceptional, and uh, we thank you for doing that and sharing some ideas with us today. Um, as I mentioned, another Trinity grad will be join, d conducting a webinar on November 20th, which will be at noon central time and it will be on a topic that many of us may find ourselves in at some point in our journey and that is caring for our uh, elderly or older parents um, but the spirit of the discussion will not be one of sadness mm. it will be one of hope and ways to see that journey in a very positive light. In fact, the topic is called How to Survive Caregiving with Sanity and a Sense of Humor. <laughs> and our alumnus is Jim Comer, class of 66, so n not as, uh, a little bit older than you. Wasn't in my you, cohort. We are not <laughs> a cohort, thank you. Um, and he is an author of a book entitled, When Roles Reverse, A Guide to Parenting Our Parents. Mm. Now, for those who are listening, if there are other topics that you would like to know about, we would love to hear your thoughts, recommendations, and ideas. We encourage you to reach out to your Trinity University Alumni Relations Office to share those with us. And for those who are listening today, uh, who live in Central and South Texas, uh, we want you to also put on your calendar Tuesday, November 19th. That is when the Maverick Lecture will bring to Trinity's campus Miss Judy Woodruff, who is anchor for the PBS NewsHour. And then right after Thanksgiving comes some tr Trinity traditions. On the first Friday of December, as is the, the tradition. Mm -hmm. I remember that. The, the Christmas holiday concert will be presented by Trinity students, and it's a magnificent, engaging performance with mm. over 300 students on stage. Mm. And following that Friday, on the very first Sunday in December, is Vespers at Parker Chapel, followed by another Trinity tradition, open house mm. on Oakmont. Christmas on Oakmont. I yes. remember that. Yes. <laughs> and very soon thereafter, on December 12th, the, our Policymakers Breakfast Series will present uh, General Dempsey, and I believe his name is General Martin Dempsey, for the Policymakers Series. You can check and get more information about all these events on Trinity's website. And of course, you're always welcome to call your Trinity 
uh, Alumni Relations Office for more information. That phone number is 210-999-8404. 210-999-8404. Now, David, we have just swept through a lot of our conversation today. <laughs> Are there any other uh, ideas or pointers you would like to share with those who are with us? Well, I'm going to share one other thing that I, I like to share with my scientist and engineer friends. Uh -huh. Okay, and it's really going against the grain. I feel like sometimes I'm a voice crying in the wilderness when it comes <laughs> to this. <laughs> and that is, never end your presentation with the Q and A. Ah. Oh. You see that done all the time, but here's what's wrong with it. One of my idols in the speaking industry is a woman named Patricia Fripp. She's well known in circles that I travel in, although many people outside the speaking world might not have heard of her. She was the first woman president of the National Speakers Association, if that means anything at all. And she says, last words linger. The last thing people hear is going to leave an impression. Well, if you're giving a presentation and the last words people hear you say are, well, I don't see any other questions, so I guess um, thank you very much. That's not going to leave much of an impression on no. people. <laughs> so what I always <coughs> like to do is to tell people, we're approaching the end. I have a couple of minutes of I like to say concluding remarks. Not, I don't use the word conclusion because that is a specific meaning in a scientific presentation. So I say, I like to have a couple of minutes of concluding remarks. And before I give you those, we have time for a few questions. And then I'll say, who has the first one to get us started? Instead of saying, are there any questions? Always ask, who has the first one to get us started? So you're assuming there are questions. You just need to give people time and the opportunity to ask them. So before I give you my concluding remarks, it looks like we may have had another question come in. <coughs> Which you might read. I would be happy to read it. What advice do you have about assuring a strong story close that prompts the audience to perhaps behave differently beyond the presentation? What a great question. It leads right into what I was talking exactly. about. <laughs> you know, when I started my presentation to those scientists on Monday, I came out and before I even introduced myself, I said, do you want to hear the good news first or the bad news? That was my strong open. And I, I said, let's take a poll. Who wants to hear the good news first? And some people raised their hands. And I said, who wants to hear the bad news first? And more people raised their hands. And I said, well, that's pretty typical because according to the research that I've read, three out of four people will prefer to hear the bad news first. But according to some other research I read recently, you're more likely to take action if you hear the bad news last. So I said, I'm gonna give you the good news first, but I want you to understand there was a scientific reason for it. And then I, before I gave them the good news and the bad news, I introduced myself. So bad news last, if you have the choice, is a good, is, has been shown to be more effective at getting people to take action. So what you want to do, this is a sales and marketing technique. It's called find the pain and twist the knife. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard that expression before? You want to find a, a way to motivate people away from some direction they're going and toward a different direction. And as I said before, the then, now, and how use of contrasting stories <coughs> is a great way to do that. There's also, there is a, a chapter in the book that I showed you earlier, the Speaker's Quick Guide to Telling Better Stories, that uh, specifically goes into how to use contrasting stories, which is a great way of motivating people to take action. We have a few minutes. Um, okay. What about an example? What about an <coughs> example? Well, I'll give you an example of the, of the concluding remarks that I often give to my scientist friends. In case you are <coughs> still skeptical about marrying storytelling with the need to talk about your science. Let's consider this. In 1609, a man named Galileo pointed a newly invented instrument, then called a spyglass, at the night sky. 
and our world has never been the same since. In 1623, after Galileo had become well established in this new science of astronomy, he published a book. And the book was called Il Saggiatore, which means the assayer. It was actually published as a refutation of a book by another astronomer named Orazio Grassi. Orazio Grassi and Galileo differed strongly on the nature of comets. Spoiler alert, they were both wrong. <laughs> but to clinch his argument, in this book, The Assayer, which is widely believed to contain the very roots, the very beginnings of what we now call the scientific method, Galileo clinched his argument in favor of observational science by telling a story. And that story began. Once upon a time, in a lonely place, there lived a man. Now, if no less a scientific luminary than Galileo can model for us the power of storytelling in conveying a concept and getting people to buy into it, mm -hmm. then who are we to say otherwise? And we certainly want to, don't want to dispute his science. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I want to first apologize to you for battling this thing that seems to be going oh, around. No apology necessary. <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, we want to thank you so much for your generosity by sharing your time and your talents for giving back to share it with all of us oh, you're very today. Uh, and we also want to thank all of you who have participated in this webinar today. It is coming from Trinity University, which is based in San Antonio, Texas. And it is part of the Alumni Relations Program of continuing and offering opportunities for lifelong learning for all our alumni, including you and your entire family of <laughs> Trinity graduates. Thank you. So from Trinity University, the home of the Trinity Tigers, we thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have a tigerific day. <laughs> Thank you.